The following satellite transmission, copyrighted by the Spiritual Renaissance Institute, is available for live broadcast in 10 seconds or for taping and rebroadcast by any AM, FM, shortwave, cable, or video outlet globally. This is a WBN Worldwide Broadcasting Network production. This is Vern Benham Grimsley with the Spiritual Renaissance Broadcast. The following is being brought to you by remote transcription. The career and character of Christ were such that one out of every three persons on this planet today calls himself or herself a Christian. His name, Jesus, was the Greek form of the Hebrew Joshua. It is translated Savior. It was a common name in Palestine 2,000 years ago. Christ is from the Greek Christos, meaning the Anointed One or the Messiah. Scholars estimate that the entire Bible covers only about 50 days in the life of Jesus, and the first 30 years of his existence are hardly mentioned at all. And yet, the ideals of his life and teachings have dominated the art, literature, and ethics of Western civilization for 20 centuries. Most human beings are products of their times. They are formed by the ages in which they live. History makes them. But Jesus made history. He was not merely molded by the ideas of his century. He molded the ideas and ideals of centuries yet to come around the supernal truths of the fatherhood of God and the brotherhood of man. This Jesus of Nazareth came not to write a creed but to teach a truth, not to build a temple but to create the kingdom of God in the hearts of men and upon this earth, not to chain men by dogmatism but to free them by faith, not only to tell us what we should be, but to tell us what we are. He lived and proclaimed a vital truth that you and I can personally know God, that we can not just find out about God, but find God, not merely know about God, but know God. And our lives can become spiritual adventures of living for divine purposes. What was this Jesus really like? It was virtually impossible to be neutral about Jesus in his own day. People either loved him or despised him either shouted hosannas of praise to him as the Messiah or cried out for his crucifixion as a blasphemer. He was variously believed to be either a prophet, John the Baptist, risen from the dead, a madman, some said he was beside himself, in league with the devil, the prince of devils, and or the prince of peace. But almost anybody who had heard of Jesus at all had an opinion about him. He was the most controversial figure of his day and of ours. Shepherds leaning on their walking staffs, their backs to the burning sun, would discuss him all afternoon. Their teeth would flash when they laughed to hear some passing traveler tell how the scribes and Pharisees in Jerusalem had tried to trick him with a question and had lost. They who, proud with learning, declared that ignorant men could not please God, discovered their own ignorance the day they asked him whether to pay taxes or not, and he replied by asking whose picture was on the coin. And when they answered Caesar's, he said, Render to Caesar what belongs to Caesar, and to God what belongs to God. Women talking at their village wells, their sandals gray with powdered dust, would tell of the Samaritan girl he asked for a drink one time and clucked their tongues at his indiscretion, for single men were not to speak to women thus. Then they would wonder what he meant by the water of life he told that girl about, which quenched, he said, the thirstings of the soul. How could this be? Some thought him a dreamer and some a deliverer, but nobody was neutral. Old men in the temple courtyard debated his heresies. Young fishermen straining hand over hand with wet nets on the Sea of Galilee wondered if he could be the Messiah. Carpenters at their splintered benches, farmers hoeing furrowed fields, young boys walking home from synagogue school all talked about this strange new preacher and of those stalwart twelve who followed him and who proclaimed that all men bond slave were free were children of the Most High God, but no one was neutral. And even yet today, a man must choose to follow the truth this Jesus spoke and lived or not. It is transformative truth, as he is a transformative person. The apostles of Jesus must have been immensely impressed by their master to follow him as they did, although we have no photographs or portraits of Jesus and hence cannot be sure how he looked. We can be fairly certain, I think, how he did not look. He did not look like the frail and faint-hearted mystic some artists have portrayed. He was a carpenter, 
broad-shouldered from swinging a hammer and driving a saw through tough timbers, strong and sinewy from lifting lumber, fitting planks, and using his tools. He had a powerful commanding voice. How else could he address thousands of listeners on a windy Galilean hillside and be heard? How else could he have given a sermon from a boat with his hearers on the shore and with the waves of water roaring in on the beach before him? He did not look pale and bleached out. How could he have walked all over Palestine, one of the sunniest lands in the world, and still have the delicate peaches and cold cream complexion some artists have bestowed upon him, I ask you? He was suntanned and rugged. He had to be. He was a man of action. He strode up to the money changers' tables in the Jerusalem temple and he turned them over. He was even criticized for being a glutton and a drunkard because he relished a good meal and he enjoyed wine with it. It's in the book. Far from being a statue in saint's clothing, he was a man. He was a man of God, living life valiantly and well by the power of God as you and I can too. And what did Jesus teach? That man is a child of God, a son of the universal Father, that all men are brethren, that indwelling the mortal mind there's the Spirit of God, and by seeking to do the will of God one can cooperate with divine purposes, thereby attaining eternal life by loyalty to eternal values, truth and beauty and goodness. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and your mind and strength. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. If somehow I could return and live one day, with Jesus and the Twelve. I wouldn't choose the time he fed the multitudes or even gave the Sermon on the Mount. I wouldn't choose the day he entered Jerusalem to the ringing hosannas of the welcoming throng, or the day that he died, or even the morning he rose again. I would choose an ordinary day, perhaps in one of their encampments by Galilee. I'd want to watch him rising in the dawn-light duskiness of early morning and with a cloak thrown across his broad carpenter's shoulders against the lakeside chill, watch him walk through the coarse grass, heavily hung with cold dew, see him kneeling, take a stick, and stir the coals of fire to flickering life again, hear him greet the apostles as they rose from their slumbers, see them eat, discuss, debate, ask questions, observe him settling an argument, laughing, playing with the children of those who came to listen to him speak, and after supper, watch from a respectful distance as he climbed a nearby hill to commune with the Father and draw strength for his mighty mission among mankind. I would learn more watching him one day than I could put into practice in one lifetime. More of patience, love, understanding, loyalty, strength, determination, joy, zest, and vitality than I could begin to assimilate. Jesus of Nazareth was not born with burnished brass trumpets blaring, not with silver horns splitting the silent midnight air with sound, not with court drummers pounding cured goatskin hides stretched over great resonant casks of wood to thunder forth the tidings that a prince had come into the world. The sounds that Jesus heard at birth were not the flutes and cymbals of the court musicians, but the quiet bleating and lowing of sleepy sheep and cattle, and every bit as beautiful. No silken-gowned, rustling-robed attendants bustled about the birth of Jesus. No statesmen of the palace came to call. No corpulent captains of the Roman guard, attired in gleaming breastplates, plumed helmets, and glistening armor, stood nearby to watch the long night through. No chanting prophets made mystic gestures and blessings of incantation the day that Jesus was born. No priestly pomp and patriarchal majesty surrounded his birth. He was born as you and I were born into a world as bitter and bothersome as our world at its worst, a world that was hungry and poor as Palestine today is hungry and poor, a world that knew the ways of war far better than the principles of peace, a world that knew more of iniquity than integrity, more of corruption than conscience, more indifference than idealism, more cruelty than kindness. Into such a world as this was Jesus born, a world much like our own. Our time is separated by centuries from Jesus' time. Thick thousands of pages of printed history divide ancient Palestine from 20th century today. Yet our problems are much the same, and hence the need to hear today the words that Jesus uttered then, the words of faith and hope that changed men's lives and made them new. For this child, this quiet child, this babe not strong enough to crawl, would turn the world upside down one day, 
By teaching God is not a leaden-hearted Lord of wrath, that God is not a jeering judge who laughs to see the pain of men, not a spiteful deity sneering at human misfortune, but a father and a friend and a good God of love and a forgiving God and a God who loves each one of us. He lived and he taught and then he died. Political might, dominion, pomp, and power are always more impressive than the quiet teaching of truth. When Caesar Augustus died, you may be certain all of Rome wore black for many days. The solemn sounds of muffled drums were heard along the flower-strewn pathway of his funeral march. Gold glinting trumpets heralded the day of his death. The flutes and pipes wailed melancholy melodies. The very statues of the fallen Caesar were garlanded with knotted blossoms in the public squares. A thousand messengers rode horses foaming at the flank to cry the news in distant provinces and protectorates, mighty Caesar has fallen, let all the world weep. Wet blades flashed red in silver sunlight as the priests of Rome with sacrificial swords gave offerings of blood and beast to the countless gods they served, for mighty Caesar had fallen, let all the world mourn. But there was another who died, who was born, and who lived, and who died in the world of Caesar Augustus. Or was it the other way around? Perhaps it was Caesar Augustus who lived in his world, the world of this Jesus of Nazareth, who died by criminal execution, rejected by the religion of his fathers. The soldiers of Caesar gambled for his robe. His body was laid in a borrowed tomb. He died without ceremony, funeral, or eulogy. Yet he is the one men remember. Not Caesar, but Jesus of Nazareth, who by his life and words proclaimed the living love of God for all humankind. As a child, he came to us, born of the womb of infinity, wrapped in the swaddling clothes of time and space. The sovereign of stars and smoldering suns he was, whose hands had held the very planets in their paths, whose fingers formed this glowing galaxy, who sprinkled the blackened sky with glistening beads of liquid light, who hung the midnight with a thousand diamond constellations, all looped like necklaces across a jeweler's velvet cloth. As a child, he came to us, born much as all men are born and dying much as all men die, but living not at all as all men live, for divinity surged in his veins. In Jesus, mankind got a glimpse of God as never prior nor since. And we have not forgotten it. The world can never be the same again, for we have seen what God is and have seen what man can be. The preceding has been brought to you by Remote Transcription. For free literature on the spiritual life, write to the Spiritual Renaissance Institute, Box 3080, Oakhurst, California, 93644. That's SRI, or the Spiritual Renaissance Institute, Box 3080, Oakhurst, California, 93644. I've written Finding God, Getting to Know God, Growing Spiritually, Seven Principles of Prayer, The Fatherhood of God, The Brotherhood of Man, Life After Death, What Happens When You Die. If you're intrigued by these very sorts of topics, write to us at the Spiritual Renaissance Institute, Box 3080, Oakhurst, California, 93644, USA. We believe that God is the perfect and loving spiritual father, that we can experience this life-transforming truth through the decisions and actions of personal faith, that all the people of this planet are brothers and sisters in our Father's spiritual family, that God has given an actual fragment of himself to live and dwell within each of us, that God has a will which is the greatest good for your life. And if you choose to seek this will, there lies before you an eternal adventure of striving to attain the supreme values of truth, beauty, and goodness. The ultimate goal is to reach for the very perfection of the Father in heaven. For free literature on these things, write to us at the Spiritual Renaissance Institute, Box 3080, Oakhurst, California, 93644, USA. For those of you listening in other countries around the world over our international satellite and shortwave network, let me spell that mailing address. 
That's Box 3080, Oakhurst, O-A-K-H-U-R-S-T, California, C-A-L-I-F-O-R-N-I-A, 93644, United States of America. This is a non-sectarian, non-profit program proclaiming the dawning spiritual renaissance, the fatherhood of God and the brotherhood of man, the worldwide family of God. And so for now, this is Vern Benham Grimsley saying, May God's will be done by you. Good day.